cult members. I was in there with all of them in the room where they were shot. Followers. Some are driven to kill. I did not consider myself a leader. I considered myself more of a follower. And others play witness to the worst in humankind. Jonestown on that day was a definition of agony. All suffer the consequences of following blindly. When you can't think outside that box, that's captivity. A scale exists to measure the darkest corners of human behavior. From impulse killings to madness-fueled violence. Calculated acts of cruelty, torture, and brutality. Forensics now reveals those among us who are most evil. The cleansing would be the killing of, of the wicked people. What makes a person a cult follower? Is it weakness, or could any of us be susceptible? Losing the ability to think for yourself can lead to any action, humiliation, torture, or even murder. Middle-class suburban teenagers blindly join Charlie Manson in a murder spree. Jim Jones leads nearly a thousand followers to a jungle utopia that will become a mass grave. Disciples of a renegade Mormon execute a family of five in the name of God. Are these devoted followers victims of circumstance, believers, or killers? When evil acts are committed by a group, where does the individual's responsibility lie? Now there is a scale that measures the different degrees of evil. It weighs a killer's motive, method, and malice. The more heinous the crime, the higher the criminal is placed on the scale. Creator of this scale, Dr. Michael Stone, forensic psychiatrist, Columbia University. My scale helps me navigate the rather turbid waters of violent crime. Yet cult killings pose an interesting challenge to Dr. Stone's scale. My scale is designed to evaluate individuals, so it's challenging, really, to attempt to place a whole group. As we investigate several examples of cult behavior, we'll see the deterioration of the self, the denial of personal reflection, the justification of evil. What would explain Ron Luff's devotion to a violent religious cult leader? 1989, Kirtland, Ohio. It says in verse 5, you shall put to death those who lead you to false gods. Jeff Lundgren leads a splinter sect of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He hopes to form an armed uprising that would create heaven on earth but manipulates his followers and leads them to commit murder. Ron Luff is Lundgren's closest associate within the group. What is your interpretation of this cleansing? A cleansing would be the killing of, of the wicked people. In 1989, Luff follows orders and helps Lundgren shoot and kill a family of five. It all started last night after police were told exactly where to find the remains of an entire family. It took the Kirtland police two days to excavate the bodies of Dennis and Cheryl Avery and their three daughters. They had been buried in a pit and covered with trash in Lundgren's barn for over nine months. I was in there with all of them, with the exception of Dennis. I was in the room where they were shot. The coroner's report discovered silver duct tape wrapped around the victim's heads, hands, and feet. It's hard to imagine how a devoted religious man like Luff could be an accomplice to mass murder, but the cult indoctrination is a slow and insidious process. Eventually, even the most heinous acts can be justified by the follower. In the late 1980s, Lundgren's reputation grew as a renegade Mormon teacher and prophet. Under Lundgren's leadership, followers believe they are to witness the second coming of Christ. 
Dennis Avery and his family are lured by the promise of life under a strict Mormon code. Ron Luff is inspired to sell his home in Missouri and move his family to join the cult. Everyone donates all their personal finances to Lundgren's vision. Heavenly Father, thank you for embracing me into your family. The cult operates like a family. All the children call Lundgren dad. Prayer meetings are seven nights a week, lasting into the morning hours. Lundgren is the choice seer, a prophet. He could lead the cult to Zion. All that is standing in their way is their sin. Amen. Lundgren takes notice of Luff's devotion. He seems willing to do anything for approval. Luff is a fifth generation Mormon. Religion is the focus of his upbringing. He even considers becoming a priest. But he sees his religion having little impact in people's lives and grows disenchanted until he meets Lundgren. Ron's status grows within the cult. Lundgren gives private counsel to Luff. He confides in Luff. He trusts him to be loyal. Basically what he told me was that I was to be the spokesman. In that came a very second in command type situation for me. In a cult, hierarchy plays an enormous role. Luff's rise to power as Lundgren's right hand man was intoxicating. It put a blindfold over Luff's sense of moral judgment. It is discovered that Dennis Avery withheld some of his donations to the cult's group fund. His wife, Cheryl, is headstrong and her children unruly. All are punishable sins to Lundgren. Lundgren invites the Averys to dinner. He says, well, I want him brought out to the barn from oldest to youngest. And uh, I was the one that brought them out. Ron and the rest of the men in the cult know the Averys are going to be murdered. It is demanded by Lundgren, their seer. Took her in, placed her in the hole. I told her, be calm and just give it up. How could Ron Luff have justified the execution of an entire family? For his involvement, Ron Luff has spent the last 17 years in prison. Dr. Stone makes his way to rural Ohio to better understand Ron's cult experience, to learn how Luff could be brainwashed, from devoutly religious to complicit in murder. When you can't think outside that box, that's captivity. I want him brought out to the barn from oldest to youngest, and I was the one that brought them out. Ron Luff, a loyal follower of a Mormon cult, leads a family of five to their death. Dr. Stone travels to rural Ohio to investigate the mind of the cult follower, to discover how loyalty can lead to murder. Ultimately, Jeff came to have a power over his group, including yourself, I gather. How did he exercise that power? Well, it was basically by our conclusion, in, as much as his enforcement of this conclusion, that he was the choice seer. Now, when he caught you up in it, as you were being led down the garden path to be complicitous in the murders, what was your thinking about? But I felt duty-bound as, as someone who has to carry out some judgment. And one of the myths about these kinds of settings is it destroys will. Well, it doesn't. It just manipulates how will is used. God was not the loving grace. He wasn't the Jesus on the cross. God had become that quaking mountain, that, that fiery mountain kind of God. And he had strict demands. When I brought Trina into the barn, I just said, well, now we're going to play a game. Someone taped her eyes and her mouth. What were some of your thoughts, if you allowed yourself any thoughts, as you were carrying this family one by one out to the barn? Allowed any thoughts. I'm sorry? Well, you said, or if I allowed myself any thoughts. Yeah. That's been an issue that people said, well, didn't you know this was going to happen? 
Well, it's impossible for you to determine what God is going to mandate from you. The idea of what you know ahead of time becomes completely invisible, completely invisible. In fact, especially in this so-called sacred moment, as this was supposed to have been, where you're doing this, this terrible thing under the guise of God's authority, the last thing you want to do is, is have sin in the process. And it would have been sin for me to think that I knew what he was going to do once they were inside. Wait a second. It would have been sin for you to know that he was going to shoot them? Why? If, if, uh... Because it wasn't for me to determine what their fate was. Yeah, but if you felt that their killing was righteous, then it wasn't a sin. Uh, no, the... the sin was not in whether or not they would die. The sin was in my thinking I would know what would happen. He could extend them grace and not have them killed. Certainly after he shot the first one, there must have been some part of your mind that knew that the other four were going to meet a similar fate. Why? Uh, well, because that's where the smart money was. If you that's, the... that's thinking outside the box. But not far off the box. There's a huge box. I remember when I got to Lucasville and I was in maximum security penitentiary and I was talking to one of the COs and he says, what's it like to be brainwashed? And I said, far more confining than this place. And I meant it. When you can't think outside that box, that's captivity. Can you recall the first moment you began to have doubt about Jeff and his, uh, the validity of his beliefs? After I left the group, which to me was an act of unpardonable sin, it wasn't because I determined he was wrong. It took time for me to determine that, but I just couldn't go any farther. God had become so ugly in my view. When, I, uh, when my conscience began to awake, I began to see Dennis Avery. I'd be at a department store at a gas station and someone would walk across and it would look like Dennis. I could smell the barn again. And I remember those sounds and I remember those views. On October 24th, 2006, cult leader Jeff Lundgren is put to death for murdering an entire family. Ron Luff, witness, accomplice, and loyal companion is serving 170 years in prison. It's a very sad commentary on the kind of things that can happen to people coming under the power of a very gifted con artist like Jeff Lundgren. And it makes you wonder uh, to what extent just who all could be caught up in something like that. And which of us is immune to being caught up in it no matter what. Dr. Stone considers the accountability of Jeff Lundgren and Ron Luff. Here is a case where there is an incongruity between the man and the deed. The deed cries out for a higher number because of the cold-blooded way this family is led to their death. But Luff lacks the sociopathic traits that would place him higher on my scale. His devout Mormon upbringing may have helped shape Luff into becoming a loyal member of Lundgren's cult. Luff was already a believer. All he needed was direction. Ron Luff, for his unwavering complicity in the Avery murders, falls at level nine. Jeff Lundgren was clearly a psychopath, violent and cruel, ironic qualities in a religious leader. He admonished the cult for their so-called sins, yet brainwashed them into committing the ultimate sin, taking another's life. Jeff Lundgren reaches the very top of Dr. Stone's scale, a level 22. When we return, what makes a follower susceptible? Are all our minds at risk to the manipulation of a cult? Is there a pattern to the cult follower? Are they damaged, vulnerable personalities susceptible to the exploitation of a powerful leader? Or could any one of us be taken advantage of by a charismatic manipulator? Charles Manson is perhaps the quintessential psychotic cult leader. His followers are middle-class kids with no strong animosities. They are starving for approval, so starving that they can be manipulated. They can be driven to kill. Tex Watson is a high school football star full of potential. At Manson's orders, 
Tex leads three girls from the cult on a killing spree. Manson is not present. They commit vicious murder and torture on their own. August 1969, Los Angeles. Four teenage members of Manson's family leave two devastating crime scenes. The bodies are mutilated. One is stabbed 51 times. Messages are cut into their flesh. Graffiti is written on the walls using the victim's blood. Manson gives Tex the knife, and Tex follows orders. I was the male uh, at the crime. Um, but at that time, I did not consider myself a leader. I considered myself more of a follower. Tex Watson may never have committed murder without the coercion of Manson, but Manson never actually kills anyone. Watson leads the slaughter of seven innocent people. Dr. Stone considers the accountability of both Manson and Watson. Like Ron Luff, Watson is the victim of circumstance blinded and bullied into participating in murder by a controlling leader. But without Manson's influence, there would have been no crime. For his ability to manipulate people to kill on his behalf, and because he instigated multiple murders, I place Manson at level 15 on my scale. But Charles Manson didn't commit the murders himself. The victims died by Tex Watson's hand. Therefore, I also place Watson at level 15. They are both psychopathic and responsible for multiple killings at one time. What makes the individual vulnerable to being swept up in a cult? How do followers like Tex Watson and Ron Luff lose their sense of morality while immersed in a cult? Some scientists believe our brains are wired to be susceptible. Well, first of all, the cult phenomenon is a group phenomenon by which individuals are focused towards a feeling of belongingness and meaningfulness. Dr. Michael Persinger is a neuroanatomist at Laurentian University in Ontario, Canada. He believes that the human brain has a weakness in the temporal lobe, the region responsible for making decisions. This weakness makes us all vulnerable to the influence of another. And brain activity effectively is a combination of electromagnetic patterns and chemical interactions. Persinger believes that by sending an electromagnetic field through a subject's temporal lobe, he can create a micro seizure in the brain. This seizure can recreate the feeling of a religious experience or a feeling of belonging. We basically imitate what happens within the brain itself during a mystical experience. As the magnetic field is sent through a participant's brain, Dr. Persinger sees a significant change in brain activity. The subject may experience what can be referred to as a higher state of consciousness. When you stimulate it excessively, the individuals feel transformed. They feel as if they're a new person, they're born again. They may feel this amount of social cohesion that they belong to a new group, a new identity. Results from the study suggest that moments of group conviction and belonging are simply manifestations of an overstimulated temporal lobe, that cult devotion might just be a symptom of micro seizures in the brain, and that perhaps people with an overactive temporal lobe are more vulnerable to manipulation. But once a cult member feels the euphoria of belonging, how can a cult leader capitalize? How do you convince a rational person to throw away their moral values? Dr. Persinger continues his research into the cult mind by looking at how a leader's speech patterns can influence the thoughts of others. Persinger suggests that there is another flaw in the human brain that may also make us susceptible, trust. He claims that in the first instant we hear any statement, our brain accepts it as true. It is in the following moments when the brain reviews the statement and ultimately chooses whether it is true or false. This is called the refutation process. When you pursue truth or falsehood, you must accept everything first as truth, and then you must refute it. If something interferes with that refutation process, you're more likely to take a falsehood and accept it as true. Is it possible to make someone accept what they know to be false as true? Persinger believes it is. He fits his subjects with a headpiece that emits a magnetic field to their brain. 
the subject is expected to answer true or false to a simple series of questions. Despite already knowing the correct answers, the magnetic fields interrupt the brain's normal course of reasoning, disrupting the refutation process. The results are unnerving. And what we have found is that when you apply these weak magnetic fields, certain frequencies result in people accepting a previous falsehood as if it were true, specifically if the field was applied during the refutation process. Can a cult leader create the same kind of distraction for the brain with a charismatic speech? Can the performance of someone like Charles Manson interrupt a person's ability to know what is true and false? How vulnerable is an individual's free will? Sincerity and honesty, trick them every time. <laughs> I said, well, sincere and honesty, I never tried that. <laughs> start an argument, start a statement produce a tremendous distraction, something that's totally off the wall, so the person does not have a chance to refute it, and they're likely to take that falsehood and accept it as a truth. And as I understand from the descriptions of Manson, that was notorious for his particular profile. When we return, Dr. Stone meets with a rare witness of the Jonestown Massacre for further insight into the group mind. Jonestown on that day was the definition of agony. In downtown San Francisco, the California Historical Society is the keeper of painful memories. Personal effects, documents, photographs. It houses the most extensive archive of Jim Jones's People's Temple and the Jonestown Experience. Former members of the People's Temple and survivors of Jonestown visit the Historical Society to help heal the wounds from what is called history's worst cult catastrophe. 1978. In the middle of the Guiana rainforest, nearly a thousand Americans have created a utopia, blind to race, age, and class. I love it. It's, I love it better than any place I've been in my life. This new society is the creation of San Francisco New Age Church the People's Temple and its founder, Jim Jones. A Christian minister turned social activist, Jones preaches that together they can create a peaceful world built on equality and freedom. On November 18, 1978, more than 900 members of the People's Temple succumbed to cyanide poisoning in what is remembered as a tragic act of mass suicide. What leads these hopeful people to their deaths? Why did nearly a thousand people follow Jim Jones to a mass grave? And did they give up their lives willingly? Jonestown is remembered as a day of unthinkable tragedy. It is the ultimate example of how far the cult mind can be manipulated. But what possesses the members of Jonestown? What does Jonestown tell us about how the minds of cult members work and about why they are willing to follow the voice of Jim Jones? More than 900 people perished in Jonestown. Tim Carter is one of only nine survivors and a rare eyewitness to the susceptibility of the cult mind. More than 30 years later, the tragedy continues to haunt him. Dr. Stone travels to San Francisco to meet with Tim Carter, a window into the cult experience. Probably the main reason that we wanted to talk to you is because you're a rare survivor of what started out uh, as a utopia that ended up a dystopia. I was committed to what, to the cause. And to me, the cause was trying to build a community that eventually would allow people to live in peace. I can look back now on things that were clearly red flags. And I chose to rationalize and ignore those red flags, which is very painful for me. Tim Carter grows up with a strict Catholic upbringing. His father is an alcoholic. Nothing Carter does is good enough. 
so he constantly looks for approval elsewhere. A gifted high school athlete, Carter wins four blue ribbons at a state track meet, even sets records. But Carter's father is not proud of his son. His success is met with only criticism. Carter searches for acceptance. In 1967, he enlists in the Marine Corps and is sent to Vietnam. He is changed forever by what he sees there. Tim Carter survives Vietnam, ready to lead his life on his own terms. But his whole life, Carter has been conditioned to follow and seek approval. There were a couple of things that I decided in Vietnam. Number one, I wanted to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. I wanted to be one of those to try to make the world a better place. You were looking for something, that, that puzzle piece, mm -hmm. and the People's Temple was that puzzle piece. Right. It just, the feeling and I got literally was that I was home. San Francisco, 1973. The People's Temple is led by its charismatic founder, Jim Jones. Why do you keep playing with that which men call God and we call socialism incarnate? I'm a liberator, I'm a savior. Jim Jones leads his simple church group into a socialist enterprise where people of all ages, races, and economic backgrounds live together. In 1973, Tim Carter goes to his first People's Temple meeting. So Jones came out and talked, and his sermon was like a synthesis of everything that I believed kind of spiritually and politically. It resonated with me, what he was saying. It was natural. And there were black and white teenagers that were playing around and flirting with each other, you know? And there were kids that were, you know, what, what kids do? They tease each other and argue and fight. It just was a very alive place. And it felt like I had known those people all my life. The People's Temple attempts to rectify the failure of the American establishment. They operate rest homes, offer child care, and instigate social change for the underclass. I worked probably 20 hours a day, every day. I loved it. I personally loved it. I mean, I was, what, 23, 24 years old. I was in the prime of my physical health. And because we were helping people in a, in, a, in a sense that I could actually see with my own two eyes, that supported what it was I was believing, because as opposed to a lot of my friends were talking about change, I felt that I was actually helping affect change. Tim Carter convinces his older sister and teenage brother to join the People's Temple. He also falls in love with fellow member Gloria Maxim, and she becomes pregnant with their son. The People's Temple is becoming Carter's life. But over time, Jones reveals darker aspects of his personality. I can look back now on things that were clearly red flags, not even yellow flags, but red flags. What would be like a first red flag? I remember it, that they brought in some wine, all right? And, you know, it was, we did drink. We didn't smoke. So does everybody want to taste a wine? I said, sure, I'll drink some wine. So I drank the wine, and he said, OK, you've all just been poisoned. Now, um, my first reaction, of course, was, oh, my god. And then my next reaction was, did this really happen? And my um, gut said, no. This doesn't make any sense. So my rationalization was, OK, why is he doing this? Well, it's supposed to be a test. People are being forced to face their own mortality. Now, was that a rationalization? Absolutely. Was that conditioning? Absolutely. Was it a suicide rehearsal? No. Should I have known at that point in time that this guy was a fraud, that he was interested in power and not in change? Absolutely, I should have been. And I look back at it now, and I just shake my head and go, how could I be? that blind. By 1977, there is a membership of 3,500 loyal followers of Jim Jones and the People's Temple. And the future holds only promise. Jones purchases 3,800 acres in the Guiana rainforest to create a society free from the persecution of the American government. Carter follows with nearly a 1,000 others with the dream of starting an ideal society free from suffering. Nineteen seventy-seven, Guyana. 
Many follow Jim Jones to form a social utopia buried deep in the rainforest. For more than a year, Jonestown is an enormous success. People united will never be defeated. The people united. Different people from different races, classes, and backgrounds are working and living together in harmony, and Tim Carter is one of them. You could sit here and talk all day long, and no words could describe the peace, the beauty, the sense of accomplishment and responsibility and, and camaraderie that's here. It's, uh, it's overwhelming, it really is. Carter's wife, Gloria, gives birth to his son, Malcolm, in Jonestown. But things begin to take a turn. Everything changed. Jones's demeanor changed. It just became um, darker and much more emotional. Jones himself is struggling. He is secretly consumed by a pharmaceutical drug habit. He becomes paranoid and preaches the threat of being destroyed by the U.S. government. He controls Jonestown with manipulation and fear, even staging false attacks to unify the people. There were gunshots being fired in the community. We were, little, we were getting shot at. To create a certain atmosphere. Well, exactly. But it never, it never once occurred to me that the leader had sent somebody into the jungle to shoot over our heads. The people of Jonestown are joined by their shared political and social beliefs. But the sensation of a group identity is heightened by the extreme isolation in the middle of a jungle and by the constant paranoid sermons of Jim Jones. The group mentality challenges what an individual would otherwise think is rational. This is how a cult operates. Giving out some little gifts that have been requested, we just arrived. Families back in the U.S. believe that Jonestown is not an idyllic utopia, but is a cult, that Jim Jones is holding their loved ones captive. Catch. Congressman Leo Ryan, accompanied by his staff and journalists, visits Jonestown to investigate these claims. Jones sees the congressman as a fulfillment of his paranoid fantasies. During his stay, Congressman Ryan learns that several members do feel trapped at Jonestown and wish to leave. Several defectors leave with the congressman and his staff and head towards a jungle airstrip. Jones sends gunmen to follow. Shots are fired. The congressman and three others are killed. Back in Jonestown, everyone is unaware of the shooting. But Carter senses the panic and chaos in the community. It felt like it was disintegrating in a sense. I literally was getting ready to open my mouth and say, we need to get out of here right now. When the announcement came in the last speaker, it said, everybody report, report to the pavilion for a meeting. All of Jonestown gathers at the pavilion to hear what Jones has planned. Backstage, Carter overhears Jones and a member of his inner circle discussing the use of poison. He turned to her and said, is it supposed to be quick? And she shook her head, yes. I mean, to this day, I've wondered, how do they know if it's supposed to be, if it was quick or not? I mean, to this day. Um, and he said, well, see if he can make it taste less bitter. And I'm going, oh my god, this guy is actually going to do this. The part of me is going, no, no, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. This isn't real. This doesn't make any sense. This doesn't compute on any level. You do not kill everybody because some people wanted to leave this community. But at this point in time, I've, I've already been shocked, and yet, Things keep on happening to make me a little more shocked or numb or dissociated. So I, I, and at this, while this conversation is going on, by now the pavilion is filled and there's armed guards surrounding the pavilion. How very much I've loved you. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. Cyanide is brought out into the pavilion and Jones asks his followers to drink the poison and take their own lives. In a desperate attempt to save his wife and child, Carter tries to convince Jones to let them leave Jonestown to hunt for a temple defector. Jones sees through his ruse. And he looked at me with shark eyes, just devoid of life or feeling. He said, would you take care of your son first? And I just looked at him, and I couldn't respond. Know what I think about now? I think that I should have said, hell yes. 
and gone and grabbed my son. Because maybe if I had done that, he actually would have let me walk out of Jonestown. My opinion is that we be kind to children and be kind to seniors and take the portion like they used to take in ancient Greece and step over quietly because we are not committing suicide. It's a revolutionary act. The children of Jonestown are the first to drink the poison. Carter realizes he's on his own. He circles the pavilion in search of his wife and son. Please get us the medication. It's simple. It's simple. There's no convulsions with it. It's just simple. Just please get it. Before it's too late, the GDF will be here. I tell you, get moving, get moving, get moving. So I go back up to the pavilion, and when I got up there, I don't know, I didn't count the bodies. There weren't maybe 10 or 12 or 15. It's almost to the point where I'm ready to leave my body because I can't take it anymore. I don't know how to handle this. It's like I wanted everything to just let me breathe. Give me 30 seconds to just breathe and go, OK, this is what's going on. And it was like everything was one step faster than I was. Then I turned to my right, and Malcolm was having poison squirted into his mouth. I can't go any farther about that. Ask me questions, but I'm not going any farther than that. At that point in time, I did kind of leave my body. I, 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 I couldn't feel anymore, because that was just an open wound. And uh, there were screams of horror. There were screams of agony. The look on Gloria's face, with tears streaming down her face, was trapped. Trapped. And no way out. And I felt rage, torture. Why aren't you doing anything? I felt complete guilt. Why didn't you do anything? Malcolm was already gone. I couldn't do anything. I could, there was nothing to do. I held Gloria and I sobbed. I love you so much. I love you so much. Malcolm was dead. He had people with cyanide. They foam oh. at the mouth. It is a horrible, agonizing death. And I held her until she died. And at that point in time, I just left. Because I was beyond feeling anything for People say, well, why didn't you die? I just watched my son being murdered. So maybe after you watch your son being murdered, you can go be a hero. But at that point in time, I was outside of myself. Please, for God's sake, let's get on with it. We've lived, we've lived as no other people have lived and loved. We've had as much of this world as you're going to get. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. November 18th, 1978. The utopian vision, the social progress, all ends in a matter of hours. Over 900 people die by cyanide poisoning in Jonestown. And I saw mothers kneeling down, holding their babies, and people crying. And uh, when I saw my wife, holding my son, who was dead. Tim Carter is one of only four who witnessed the Jonestown massacre. He loses his sister, his wife, and his son. All I know is that Jonestown on that day was a definition of agony. And whatever was going on, it wasn't a, a grand kind of salute to Jim Jones because everybody wanted to die. When people say drinking the Kool-Aid, they, when they think of Jonestown, they think everybody just lined up and said, Yahoo, we're all going to die because we love Father. And it's just not the truth. Carter is brought back to Jonestown to identify the bodies two days after the massacre. What was really disturbing to me was to see that people did fight. And anybody says that people didn't fight for the survival in Jonestown doesn't care to know what the truth is, because that's the truth. Number one, children don't commit suicide. All right, so I, I think everybody would agree with that. Yes. Senior citizens, you know, if you don't have the physical ability to defend yourself, to me, that's murder. There are others who escaped that describe people being injected where they sat or being held down on the ground and injected, that describe babies being pulled from mother's arms. Carter escaped Guyana with his life, but after 30 years, the misconceptions about Jonestown still plague him. Well, this one particular picture actually is my niece and my brother's wife, they were part of that. This picture has been used more than any other picture of Jonestown to represent this is what happened. These families died together with their arms around each other. And yet, it was very obvious to us that were there, or to me, 
that it had been arranged, that those bodies had been posed. And I'm sure Jones did that. I'm sure he orchestrated every thing that went on that day in terms of what he wanted to leave the world. The, the core of it was concentrated in Jim Jones. When you get toward the core, you pick up people who were more complicitous, who right. were influenced certainly, over others. Who certainly tried. those who were closest to him were more complicitous yeah. because somebody had to bring the cyanide in. Somebody asked me, who murdered your son? Well, I didn't save my son. I didn't save my son. So did I murder my son? No. Did I save my son? No. So does that, am I absolved of all responsibility? No. I don't think there's any words in the English language to describe the, um, the crime that took place in Jonestown. And I'll have guilt for the rest of my life that I didn't do something to stop it. But maybe I could have. I saw what I saw. When I was walking across the field out of Jonestown, I just promised myself and I promised those people I will not ever forget. I will not let people forget. I will tell the story because I feel loyalty to the people that died there. They deserve better. You know, however flawed we were as a group, however flawed we were as people, they deserve better than what they have been afforded in terms of history because what happened there was not mass suicide. It was mass murder. Carter's claims of murder at Jonestown greatly affect how I will place these crimes on my scale. Previously, I ranked Jim Jones at level 12 for manipulating nearly a 1,000 people into committing suicide. But with Tim Carter's new information that Jones and his accomplices systematically murdered hundreds, including a shooting of a US congressman, I must then reevaluate their crimes with this information in mind. It is for this reason that Dr. Stone places the members of Jonestown who committed murder at level 15 for the cold-blooded spree of multiple killings. But Dr. Stone places Jim Jones much higher. For the design and execution of more than 900 innocent people, Jim Jones falls out at the top of Dr. Stone's scale, 22. They do the bidding of charismatic leaders with unquestioning loyalty. Have cult followers lost the ability to think for themselves? Comparing the followers' nature and severity of the crime, Dr. Stone gains further insight into his scale of evil. Examining the group mind helps us learn much about the individual, how one can reshape one's views on morality, responsibility, and weakness when immersed in a cult setting. It is a warning to us all to be aware of our own vulnerability and to acknowledge how susceptible any of us could be when caught up in a cult.